Hi, this is Dr. Jones. I'd like to welcome you to Micro, and I hope this short tutorial on how to use an oscilloscope is helpful. For our first task, before you begin using the scope, let's calibrate it. We've got a two-channel scope. Here I've got one channel connected. Here's a second channel connected. We want to make sure that these channels both work. So the first thing is, looking at these calibration things, we need to connect one lead, the top lead of the scope, to the top bar, and the ground lead of the scope to the ground bar for each of the two channels. Because this is a two-channel scope, the first thing we'll need to do is make sure the channel is on. You can see it's already on here. And I can use these buttons here to turn channels on and off. Here's the channel that I've not connected. Obviously, by pressing it again, I can turn that off. Here's channel one. I can toggle that on and off. So we'll take turn channel one on. I should be getting a one kilohertz square wave at approximately 5 volts. So that's the first thing to check. We can use this position knob to bring the position of the scope up and down. And we should be able to measure 5 volts. So according to my scale, channel 1 is 100 millivolts. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is reporting 500 millivolts instead of 5 volts. So what we need to do is adjust the probe compensation. You can see how important calibration is because this reveals that the oscilloscope will not tell you the truth until you fixed it. So here we can again see that channel 1 is set up for 100 millivolts per division, therefore it's claiming the height of that wave is 500 millivolts. However, by looking very carefully at this point on the probe, if you read a probe, this probe says 10x. If we look over at the other side of the menu, currently our probe claims that it's a 1x. Obviously that's the problem. So what I'm going to do is press the channel 1 button a couple times just to make sure I've got the menu up, and then I'm going to press this button to change the probe to a 10x. So, looking again at the voltage now claimed, we've got channel 1 indicating 1 volt per division, giving us an overall height of 5 volts. We're now confident that the oscilloscope is correctly reading the voltage. Next, after calibrating channel 1, let's go and calibrate channel 2. I'm going to remove the channel 1 probes. Here's my channel 2 probe. Again, the top probe will go to the top pin, the bottom ground lead will go to the ground pin. And notice currently nothing is displayed on the scope. Don't panic. That's because we need to turn channel 1 off and channel 2 on so we can focus on that. Here we've got another challenge. We have a seemingly random wave, but there's a couple reasons that that's occurring. So let's take a look at that. So here we have a seemingly random signal and we're going to work with triggering to make that signal viewable. So first of all, what we need to do is press this trigger button to take us to the trigger menu. First thing to look at, is this an edge trigger or video trigger signal? That may look right, but never use a video trigger. That's not going to solve the problem at hand. Next is, what channel are we triggering on? In this case, channel 2 is the channel that's actually connected to the scope. Right now, the trigger is only looking at channel 1. So an important thing is, moving that channel so we actually trigger off the correct channel. Once the trigger is set properly, we also need to look at the trigger level. If that level, there's a little arrow, is too high, again we get something random, or if that level is too low, it becomes random. A common problem is you can't even see the little arrow. It might be hiding down here at the bottom, but there's a number right down here that tells you where that trigger is. Currently negative 5.24 volts. So what we'll do is spin this trigger level knob, bring it up to negative 3, negative 1 volt, and finally once we find that trigger it becomes useful. Now that we've got the scope triggered, what we can do is we can play around a little bit to get the wave we're looking at. Notice that there's several different modes. An auto trigger, a normal trigger, and a single trigger. What a single trigger does is freeze the, <coughs> the waveform, take one sample and then freeze the waveform. So even if I disconnect my source, what I'm seeing is frozen and that allows me to examine the signal in more detail. And in fact, that's the mode that's going to be very helpful in just a moment when we go and look at serial transmission. Let's take a look at the use of an oscilloscope with the ECHO test program. So. Here we have the bootloader program, the bully boot bootloader pulled up. I can click here in the middle and type some letters in and you'll see them echoed. If we move over here, we've got the setup provided. The PIC24 breadboard is wired up and we've got two channels, 
one channel on the transmit signal and another channel on the receive signal so we can see that character both arrive to the PIC and be transmitted from the PIC back to the PC. All right, so now let's look at what these characters look like as we view them on the oscilloscope. So first of all, I'm going to type a few characters and we're going to look for those to show up here on the scope. So let's take a look at what serially transmitted characters look like on the oscilloscope. So we're going to type a few letters and see if we can see something on the scope. And if you notice, we'll just see a few spikes right here in the middle. That means we need to adjust our triggering. So let's start. Right now we're at 10 milliseconds. So while we continue to type characters, we'll adjust that triggering and you notice that we're seeing more and more characters being transmitted there. And it oddly enough appears like they're on top of one another. That's because both channel 1 and channel 2 are displaying. So we can use the position knob to bring one channel above the other. So I'll put one channel up top and the second channel down below it. So now we have two sets of characters. We can use this horizontal knob to change where that signal is displayed. So I'll put it at the beginning so we can kind of see both waveforms at the same time. So we can see a character being transmitted from the PC, received by the PIC, and then almost immediately echoed back by the PIC. And this will give us an opportunity to look at cursors. Now right now, if I stop typing keys, you'll notice that signal goes away. There's times when we really want to examine things in detail. So what I'm going to do is go over here to the trigger menu and instead of auto trigger, let's go to a single trigger. Now if I type one letter on the keyboard, this will see the trigger happen and it'll freeze that image for me, allowing me to think about it and look at it in a bit more detail. So let's take a look at this character. First of all, what we'd like to do is measure bit times and word times and things like that. I'm going to press the cursor button up here that will allow me to do some measurements. In particular, if I now use these two knobs, I can control the position of those cursors. So you can see a small line here moving back and forth. For example, I can move one line over here to the beginning of the transmitted character using the second knob. I can move this line to the end of that stop bit and then automatically I can see that that took 39.2 microseconds and those readings are done for me automatically. Or if I wanted to know how long each bit takes, here it looks like I've got one bit at about 4.4 microseconds. So that illustrates use of the cursor and also use of two channels simultaneously. One to look at the received character and a second channel to look at that transmitted character. Now a quick side note, there are two types of cursors. We're currently using time cursors so you see one vertical line here and another vertical line there. If we press this button, we can turn the cursors off or even have voltage cursors. Well, now I've got cursors that allow me to measure two differences in voltage. Typically, we'll be measuring those time differences, so just make sure you've got the cursor type selected as time to carry out these time-based measurements. This concludes our tutorial of oscilloscope usage. I certainly hope you found it useful.